The following is a paid advertisement. The views expressed are the sole responsibility of the advertiser. Put the power back in your hands. This is Behind the Law with attorney Justin Clark. Welcome to the show, and what a great show we have planned for you today. As always, my co-host, Michaela Nichols, is here. Michaela, you're going to probably start talking about my sock game today. You don't like it. Obviously, no, I love your sock game. And here's what I don't like about (laughs) you. I, I, I love you, I do. But you will not let me cut my hair. And I see myself in, in, in the mirror here, mm-hmm. and my hair, it looks horrible. It's kind of like and Wolverine no, vibes. No, no, I'm having the lady come cut my hair at the office on Monday. It's going to happen. That sounds really bougie. Everyone, what do you mean? I Everyone think, at home is saying, I don't think please I really cut your hair. You're the your only person doing. who says, no, 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 don't mm-hmm. cut your hair. Everyone wants me to get it cut. You really like this? This is just so, yeah. yes or yes. no? Just yes, it's so. great. No, it's. I just think, you know, I don't want to offend people by them. You know. We have a great show today. You're gonna <laughs> learn. You're, oh, absolutely. You're gonna learn a lot today. Here's the deal. So one of my my good buddies is is probably the best employment lawyer in town. I know he's the best employment lawyer in town. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked at the, the the big the big firm here for a while. Started his own firm a few years ago. It's all about employment law. It, it is because you think about it. When you're an employee, things happen at times. Carlos Leach will join us today to talk about all things employment law and also workers' comp because workers' compensation is something you don't hear a lot about. And, and it's one of those things that I think that, that employees do need to know about. So I'm gonna teach you a lot about workers' comp today, employment law, but then also we see all the billboards, they say, uh, I got a million dollars for my personal injury accident. And we've talked to you on the show before about to get a million dollars from a personal injury accident, things have to go really badly for you. I can almost guarantee you you don't want that million dollars. And we have a trauma surgeon here, a good friend of mine too, Dr. Daniel Fellow, is gonna talk about what it's like when you have that auto accident, what your injuries really look like once you get to the hospital. And mm. it can be pretty bad. Michaela, sure. are you ready? I am. Here's what we're gonna do. Quick break, and by quick break, I mean 30 second break. When we get back, Carlos Leach joins me to talk about employment law and workers' compensation behind the law. Continues. Having debt can leave you feeling helpless. I'm attorney Justin Clark. Filing for bankruptcy may give you the power to lower or even eliminate the payments that have you living paycheck to paycheck. Call me now for a free consultation or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your life. Does student loan debt have you spinning out of control? You are not helpless. At attorneys Justin Clark and Associates, our goal is to lower or even eliminate your monthly payments. Call me today or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your financial life. What a treat I have today, and, and it's always a pleasure for me when I get to introduce you to not only a great lawyer, but someone who is a, a dear friend of mine, and, and Michaela, Carlos Leach is here, great guy. I can't figure out if he's a better lawyer or guy, because it's both. Carlos Leach, welcome to the show, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You are uh, number one in this market, at least according to me, and I think most people too. If you ask any other lawyers, who's the best employment lawyer in town? It's uh, Carlos Leach, I have no doubt about it. But I want to start with workers' compensation because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about workers' compensation and workers' comp is different than personal injury. If you get hurt on the job, it is totally different than getting hurt in an automobile accident. What is the difference? Yeah, absolutely right. First of all, uh, that's one of the first things we have to explain to clients when, when they come to us and ask us questions about workers' compensation. But in general, you get two basic benefits from being hurt on the job. One, you get medical benefits, and two, you get what we call indemnity benefits, which is either lost wages or permanent disability benefits, but that's it. You don't get other things that are common to personal injury cases like pain and suffering and uh, loss of enjoyment of life, or even if your spouse had a claim, those things are not uh, possible in a workers' compensation claim. And we must explain that to these clients in the beginning, or otherwise there might be some common misconceptions. So, and let me ask you straight up, it's better to get injured in a personal injury claim than a worker's comp claim at the end of the day. In general, okay. um, and listen, at the end of the day, you're still injured, yeah. right? Uh, I don't know that people can, can uh, retroactively go back and make a choice, right? but at the end of the day, you usually can get more benefits through a personal injury case. You know, it's weird if you're uh, an employee and you're working for someone and you like your boss. I mean, you, you like your coworkers and you don't mm-hmm. want to be the guy who gets injured on the job and, and you feel like a, a wuss kind of, you, right. you feel bad. You, you don't want to get your boss in trouble. 
How does that work? How do employees really come to terms with the fact that I got hurt, I got hurt on the job, mm -hmm. I really need to take a few weeks off, but I don't want to screw my boss up in any way. How do you come to terms with that? So this is a common issue we see. Uh, and at the end of the day, most employees are loyal to their companies, right? Yeah. Some people have worked for the companies for years. And if they get hurt on a job, there's this sense that they don't want to make a claim and, and seem like the person who's out to get the employer. So there's some hesitation sometimes that they don't want to make a claim. And you got to really be careful about that because one of the first things that has to happen in a workers' compensation claim is there needs to be notice to the employer. Uh, it's got to be fair that the employer is aware of the accident and the injury. Uh, in Florida, notice has to happen within 30 days. Uh, there have been many instances where employees you know, they might feel some nagging injury in the shoulder, the knee, the back, uh, weren't really certain whether it was a, a serious injury and it gets worse over time. Uh, a lot of times we'll have employees who will go to their primary care doctor. Right. Doc, my back is starting to bother me and they forget it might have been after they lifted some heavy desk at work or anything close to that, but it all stemmed from the work accident. They didn't make the, the uh, employer uh, aware of the injury at first and now we got a problem. Now, let, let's say that I, I'm at home watching right now mm -hmm. and, and I did get hurt on the job recently, but I, I really don't want to cost my my employer, my boss money because I like him. Nice right. guy. She's a nice lady. Most of these businesses have workers comp insurance, don't they? Absolutely. Most companies have workers compensation insurance. And in fact, in Florida, you must have it if you have a minimum, minimum number of employees, which is usually four. Right. Uh, and it's it's not terribly expensive. Uh, the bigger companies have had multiple work accidents over time. They don't take it personal. Uh, another uh, issue that employees have is they, they worry about retaliation. Mm. They worry whether they're going to be fired, demoted, suspended, or lose out on benefits because they've been hurt on the job. That's right. a big hurdle a lot of times. Now, if I'm an employer and, and I have one of my employees who, who does file workers' compensation claim, can I just fire them? Can I retaliate against them or no? I wouldn't advise it. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it happens. Yeah. Um, I will say the bigger companies usually don't do that. They're used to following that process. They don't take it personal. Mid-sized companies, sometimes they do. Smaller companies, for sure. Uh, it's definitely illegal for a company to retaliate against an employee because they uh, want workers' compensation benefits. And yeah. that, that actually brings about multiple statutes, which I could go into for for hours, but uh, let's just say that's not a path that an employer should choose. And, and it leads me to another question. And, and for you as well, whether you're an employee or an employer, you might own your own business or you work for a business. I think what we're gonna ask next is is truly important. And it's a question that, that literally I think most people don't know the answer to. And that is, so you have an employee, all right? And, and they, they, they're on salary. They're gonna work 40 hours a week. What if they work 50? What if they work 60? Or, or what if you have an employee who is getting paid hourly and, and they, they're going to work 40 hours, but you want to have them stay for a couple extra hours yeah. one night to finish some things up? This overtime thing, it's very confusing for people, whether it's an it employee is. or an employer. Overtime is confusing. What is the law on overtime? So you hit on a, a huge issue, which I always, always say the salary overtime issue is probably one of the biggest misconceptions there is. Many people think that just because you earn a salary, you are not entitled to overtime. That is not true. It's far from true. The general rule is typically an employee is entitled to overtime if they work more than 40 hours within a work week. Hmm. The exceptions are if you are a salary worker and you are uh, in uh, mid to high level management, or uh, for example, you are a professional like a, a, a nurse, or a doctor or a lawyer, those people fall within certain exceptions. But generally speaking, most employees are eligible for overtime. Hmm. And the burden is on the employer to make sure they keep track of these hours, that they document it, and they pay the employees uh, basically time and a half their normal regular rate of pay. And there are consequences if you don't do that. Um, the damages can be very hefty. You know, an employee obviously can receive time and a half. There's this damage called liquidated damages, which means it's double whatever the regular damages were. You have to pay attorneys uh, if they're successful for litigating these cases. Right. And the worst case scenario is if you've got 
a hundred employees where you misclassify mm -hmm. them. Now you might have a class action on your hand and that can go back three years in certain states and sometimes even longer than that. So it's uh, very important for an employer to stay on top of th these things. And I know you don't represent employers necessarily, but you're always happy to talk to business owners about what they can do better to make sure everything's documented to make sure they're doing things the right way. You represent employees. You yes. represent employees who have been damaged. And, and something that a lot of people don't know is you do it on, on sort of a contingency fee or I don't have to pay you anything up front. How does that work? Well, one thing I've, I've recognized over the years is most employees, when they've been wronged, whether it's termination, they're owed money, they don't have money to go pay in a lawyer, yeah. okay? Um, most people I represent, they have a name tag on their shirt, okay? Right. Uh, so they don't have the extra money to go paying me $2,500 for a consultation fee or a retainer. And so, you know, once we speak to a client and we assess the situation, we're glad to take the case on a contingency fee basis. Yeah. Uh, if we don't win the case, you won't owe us anything, but I feel like that's a benefit that uh, most employees appreciate. It's a weird time for immigration right now. It's uh, you know sort of a political battle, I guess. We have a lot of, of immigrants coming over and, and mm -hmm. take whatever side you want. W what is the rule with, with hiring someone who, who doesn't have a social security card or who's not uh, a citizen? What are the rules on that? So from an employment standpoint, because we can go down the employment avenue, yeah. we can go down the immigration avenue, but strictly from an employment standpoint, Employers can hire immigrants, but they have to go through the normal documentation, mm -hmm. okay? There's certain work visas that people are supposed to have. So it's possible you can hire these people. But what we see is a lot of the employers don't go through proper channels. And uh, the effect is the employer can be fined and it could also cost the employee certain benefits. For example, uh, we see this very common, commonly in Florida, uh, undocumented worker gets hurt on the job. Yeah. Are they entitled to benefits? Typically, they're only entitled to medical benefits, not lost wages, which really? is a shame because, yeah. you know, most of these people work just as hard as their co-workers. Harder. And, you know, the employer reaps the benefit of this person working just like anyone else. But that's the way the law is structured. And that's what we have to deal with. Yeah. Carlos Sweets, we love you, buddy. I feel like you're, you're doing God's worth. I'm proud of you, by the way. Uh, I've seen you grow a lot recently, expanded in other markets. I just think you're a fantastic lawyer, a fantastic guy. I appreciate guy. it. Carlos Leach, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Here's what we're going to do. A uh, quick break when we return, as we talked about earlier. And Michaela, I, I know that, that this is scary for you. You don't like blood, okay? I, I don't. But I think I it's important can't. that you, you get to understand because it seems like we celebrate right now these personal injury sell, settlements. Uh, I made a million dollars. I made $500,000. And I want to be very clear with you, to, to get a million dollars in a personal injury settlement, you are very badly injured. And when you see I got a million dollars, you probably walked away with 400,000. Or if you, you see I got 500,000, you probably walked away with 250,000 or 200,000. I have a trauma surgeon, one of the best ones here in the Central Florida area to tell us what those injuries actually look like when you go to that hospital. Behind the law, continue. Do IRS threats have you spinning out of control? You are not helpless. At Attorneys Justin Clark & Associates, our goal is to lower or even eliminate your IRS debt. Call me today or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your financial life. Does credit card debt have you spinning out of control? You are not helpless. At Attorneys Justin Clark & Associates, our goal is to lower or even eliminate your credit card debt. Call me today or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your financial life. Welcome back to the show. And I'm excited about this interview. I really am because, first of all, I, I know this guy well. But it's also, I think, informative for you in that we talk about law here and we talk about, uh, you see billboards, I got a million dollars, I got $500,000. And number one, when you see that billboard that says I got a million dollars, that person did not get a million dollars. They have to pay medical costs. They have to pay legal fees. Normally, a, a good rule of thumb is you get 40 to 50% of what shows up on that billboard. But to get big numbers like that, you definitely went to the hospital. And who better to ask about what that trip to the hospital, likely in that ambulance, actually is like for you if you go through that than our good buddy, Dr. Daniel Felling. He's a trauma surgeon. Doc, how are you, buddy? 
I'm doing all right. I uh, love the uh, hat look. Uh, yeah, I, I want to I'm... change clothes right now. I, know, <laughs> I, I feel like I had to wear a suit because it's a law show. Yeah. But... Definitely a lot cooler than you. Excuse wow. me. Sorry. Wow. Just calling it's it like coming, it is. I want to talk about you. the shoes first. These are <laughs> not Crocs. Do not call them Crocs. These are what? <laughs> uh, they're Yeezy foam runners. Yeezy? I got to get some of these. I mean, how do you, is there like a waiting list for you? I think Yeezy's like <sighs> There's the uh, man, yeah, right? Yeah, there's some apps, you know, <clears throat> that you can get them at. But um, yeah, they're a little bit exclusive, but getting less, getting to be less so. But they're very comfortable. Like, First of all, how do you look uh, like you're, you're 24 still? I mean, it's unbelievable <laughs> to me. You look, Lots you look, Botox. is that right? <laughs> Botox, what it is? Yeah. What's it like working uh, there in the ER as a trauma surgeon? I mean, we've seen TV shows about it. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, a lot of people out there who, who want to be doctors think about, I want to go save lives. What is it really like there in that uh, ER saving lives? Well, it's not like Grey's Anatomy. Uh, I'll <laughs> tell you that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot dirtier uh, and less sort of, you know, we don't get a lot of the glory that they get on TV. It's um, it, it's about the rawest of emotions you could imagine. Um, you know, mixing in life-threatening injuries mm -hmm. with, um, you know, the stress of that, then bringing in family members and uh, having, you know, yourself being nervous and, and uh, you know, high, like very tense uh, situations. So, you know, relying on a good team and sort of experience and good training and uh, try to do the best you can with the patient. How desensitized do you get to <laughs> life and death doing that every day? Uh, yeah, it's a definite uh, coping mechanism. You know, right? uh, throughout training years, you sort of figure out. I always say, you know, as the med students that I, you know, that'll um, work with or proctor at the hospital, I, you know, I say you're going to figure out very quickly whether you're surgical or non-surgical, uh, and then if you're surgical whether or not you want to be some sort of a, you know, emergency surgeon um, because you either love it or you're terrified of it. And uh, even if you do love it, there is a, a very long progression, you know, that you go through in terms of, you know, the first time you see somebody die or you weren't able to save them, it's um, very upsetting. And not that it becomes less upsetting with time, but, you know, you, you do have to adapt a little bit. Uh, Let's pretend like uh, an auto accident case just came in, mm -hmm. okay? And, and mm -hmm. you're, you're really trying to save that person's life. I imagine many times when that case comes in, mm -hmm. there's also family members right outside that door. How do you go from trying to save a life mm -hmm. to then also walking through those, those double doors that swing mm -hmm. open and talk to that family? How does that work? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, that part never gets easier. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I... You know, having to tell a you know a spouse or you know parents that they you know their loved one just perished or you know is in critical condition, we're having to rush them off to the operating room. Um, yeah, it's a, there's just no good way to do it. Um, so it's yeah, it's stressful. You try to be compassionate, you try to empathize with them, but you know at the same time, if and you know especially if you're going to surgery with the patient, it has to be expeditious. So right. you try to provide a quick update, and you know they always have a million questions, which you know, I would too, if I yeah, were them. Sure. Um, but you got to sort of develop a strategy in terms of giving them the pertinent information and then, you know, getting on your way, so. Are you staring at me? Well, you yelled, <laughs> so you don't know, Michaela yelled at me during the break I about did. not giving her an mm -hmm. opportunity to ask Carlos Leach a question. I can tell you're interested in Well, there was in a lot Fallon. of gravity in what he was just I saying. Know. Like, I can't imagine being a, like in a situation like that, yeah. but. I mean, obviously, let's say you save people's lives every day, right? Mm -hmm. So after that, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of expenses with that. And I'm sure a lot of people, I mean, you never anticipate that. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have to talk to them about that? Or? Never. No. Nope. But, uh, you know, we have a behind the scenes team, you know, the mm -hmm. case managers, you know, different financial people will come and gather all that information. Um, we. You know, we care for anybody. Uh, it doesn't matter if they have insurance or not. They come into our emergency department. They need surgery. We're bringing them to the operating room. Yeah. I think that is a great question, actually. I mean, it, it's somewhat church and state. You're there to save lives. You Absolutely. can care less how much money they have or how yep. much yeah. insurance they have. Yep. And, and and you shouldn't be. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it, it's fully church and state. And yep. I think that's how we should keep medical care. You you don't want to be sitting there thinking, well, right. should I work, work harder to save this life or not? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the... The great part about being a doctor um, in general is there's no cookbook way to do everything. Sure. You rely on your training, you rely on your experience, and there's different ways that you can sort of tailor, you know, it's sort of like artistry, you know, you kind of can get to the same endpoint, right. but you develop your own, you know, your own style. And um, 
you know, I don't want to be wasteful for sure, but I also, if I want a study done, if it's going to change my management of the patient, I want to be able to order it. And I think that's a, mm-hmm. a very great point. Mm-hmm. And obviously we're coming sort of hopefully to the end of this pandemic. And uh, mm-hmm. what was it like being in that ER as a trauma surgeon yeah. these last two years? You know, the interesting part, I mean, the COVID part of it all, you know, as I'm a surgical intensivist as well. So um, we managed some of the trauma patients who came in COVID positive, um, but also we would do procedures, tracheostomies and peg tube placements on the medical side of the COVID, you know, people. But, you know, the chicken or the egg, a lot of times, um, this is a whole sort of separate um, topic, but you know, that trauma patient, were they so sick that it caused them to crash their car or get injured on the job or, you know, and then there's all sorts of different financial ramifications based on that, you know, by the the government and and, uh, reimbursement and all that. So um, that was an interesting twist on it. You know, it's not just a trauma patient. We, in the early days, we had to assume everybody was positive who came into, you know, our trauma base. So um, and people might not know when you when there's a trauma, it's either uh, if you're a stable patient, uh, you come in and just be seen by an emergency room doctor. And if they need us with trauma surgery, we'll come down and, and in consultation, we'll see the patient. But if you're in a serious injury and there's different criteria that the EMS providers go by, uh, but if you qualify for a trauma alert, uh, level one, which is the most serious, or a level two, which is slightly less serious, uh, the whole trauma team gets activated in the trauma bay. And so that includes the physician, you know, mid-level providers, uh, nurses, radiology techs, lab techs, everybody converges in the trauma bay um, the EMS uh, providers bring the patient in, we put them on the table, we take their clothes off and start the head to toe examination. So in the early days when we didn't really know how serious COVID was gonna be, it was pretty terrifying. Yeah. I mean, you didn't know if this patient, m- many of them are unconscious. You couldn't ask them, hey, have you had a cough or right. a fever? You know, so, um, and then in the early days of PPE shortages, you know, we were kind of doing the best we could with masks and things like that. So that sort of COVID had a weird sort of twist on on trauma in general but um but we've sort of navigated you know and adapted and i think healthcare in general has taken a big hit uh, over the last couple of years in terms of you know just being you know overworked and you know you feel fatigued it's the um, you know everybody's understaffed and sure. um but yeah so that's uh I think it's interesting what you've done as well, and I find it fascinating. You've gone from this you know, level one trauma center, uh, a trauma surgeon, and you've tried to use that experience and you've created this med spa as well. And we hear about med spas all the time, mm-hmm. but, but what you've created there is you literally have you there, a trauma surgeon, a guy mm-hmm. who's been saving lives forever, overseeing all of that. Because sometimes when you wow. hear med spa, you're like, okay, you, you go get like an 80 year old doctor and right. he'll sign off on it. You're the medical director, yeah. You're there, you're mm-hmm. the medical director trauma surgeon to make sure all of your patients and customers at this med spa are safe. Tell me about the med spa. Yeah, it's uh, it's called Dime Medical Artistry or Dime Med Spa. Um, dime comes from, you know, a scale of one to 10, a 10, uh, <laughs> uh, a dime. But um, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's been an interest of mine for many years. I, uh, going through training, I have four children and always behind on bills and looking for extra ways to, you know, make money. and. Um, I had gotten turned on to Botox injecting uh, way back when in early residency. So I started taking some training courses and started injecting friends and family and um, it just sort of grew. Um, you know, the aesthetics industry is very up and coming. It's be, you know, many more people are getting things done. And, you know, I really, uh, it, it's a nice sort of dichotomy between the, the crazy craziness of the hospital. It's a, uh, to be able to go to the, to the spa and help people feel better about themselves. And uh, it's a rewarding uh, experience, but it's also sort of therapeutic, you know, to be in that environment versus the, uh, uh, versus the trauma bay. You go from the trauma bay and uh, being stressed there to going to your med spa and the, the receptionist is stressed out about getting too many calls and yeah. you look at them and you're like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is not stress. Yeah, <laughs> it happens every day. Is that right? Uh, every day. Yeah. Well, so. What is the be- where, where are you located? And is there a website I can go to yeah, uh, for so, the med spa? So dimemedicalartistry.com, uh, and then we're just uh, we're in Lake Nona, so okay. uh, just off the 417 um, on Narcusi. So real quick in about 45 seconds too, because mm-hmm. I want to tie this back into to law a little bit, because mm-hmm. we celebrate these personal injury cases mm-hmm. in this market. We celebrate having these auto accidents. 
What is that person who comes in, who ultimately ends up on a billboard saying, mm -hmm. I got a million dollars, what do they look like when you see them in the, in the trauma bay? You're, you know, there are still shots. You're not watching that patient walk. You're not seeing the, you know, usually months or even years of pain that they've been through yeah. to get to that point. Um, they smile big and get makeup on and they get applauded for having won X number of dollars. But yeah. the pain and suffering they go through uh, is, you know, as I can attest to uh, excruciating uh, often, so. Doc, thanks for the great work you do. I, I can tell you if, you know, heaven forbid something happens to, to Michaela or me or, or, or my family, um, mm -hmm. I, I sure hope that uh, when, when we took that ambulance ride, you would be the guy there to, to watch out for. Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. Unbelievable. Yep. Well, Dr. Thank you Dana for Felling, great to have you time. here. Appreciate what, it. What a pleasure it was. Yep. Quick break, when we return, what did Michaela learn behind the walking table? I'm here with Steven Bader, the COO of IQ Power Solar. Steve, as you know, I went solar at my house with IQ Power Solar. Thank goodness that I did. There are a lot of door knocking companies out there. There are a lot of these sales organizations that pretend to do solar. They are not IQ Power Solar. What separates you? Well, yeah, I mean, it's an exciting industry and a lot of people are getting into it. And uh, that's a good thing, right? For the most part, no one says, oh, I want to just put as many panels on the roof. That's not a good investment. We understand home energy. We understand how to get the best return on your investment. And we understand that at the end of the day, you're not buying a solar system. No one says, I can't wait to get up and look at my system. You're buying an outcome. So that's what we focus on. We focus on an outcome, a promise, someone to hold accountable for that promise, and, a, and you know, a 40 year commitment to it. So that's what we do. Uh, really what made us switch to solar was our electric bill was insane. It was six, seven hundred dollars a month. What made me choose IQ Power was I had a bunch of people obviously come knock on my door um, and I just went through and did some research on it. I liked that they were all under one contract. It wasn't uh, multiple contractors. Everything was handled through the same uh, individual um, and they knocked everything out in a timely manner and really worked it out for us. They had the best warranties and guarantees in the business, and my wife really liked that. Um, they were fantastic to, uh, to work with. Thank you for what you did for me and my family, Steve, IQ Power Solar. Do yourself a favor, give IQ Power Solar a call today. You will not regret that decision. It's my pleasure, thanks for having me. And as always, we wrap it up with what did Michaela learn today, Michaela? What did you learn? There's a lot of pressure there. Why do just, I feel like you're gonna go straight honest. Botox now? We talked no. about so many important issues and I know for no. a fact you're gonna go straight Botox right no, now. No, I think it's really important that people are able to receive workers' comp if you're hurt on the job. Um, super important. <laughs> I feel like you scripted this. <laughs> no, I, I, I did I, I would have bet I, you my house you would go I right not. to Botox here. No, I, I'm trying not to. And then you um, went so straight I'm to stalling. workers' comp is important. It's very important <laughs> and uh, you should definitely, if you're hurt, reach out to, to our friend. Um, and then, you know, our, our lovely doctor friend that was on, I can't imagine the work that he does. That's crazy, um, I know. He's truly a you know, godsend. And uh, I also learned that I might go to the med spa. So, yeah. Excellent job as always. <laughs> Michaela Nichols, always a pleasure to share the stage with you. Uh, to Carlos Leach, to Dr. Felling, and, and our great crew here as always. Most importantly, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week for more Behind the Law. The proceeding was a paid advertisement. The views expressed were the sole responsibility of the advertiser.